I think everyone would like to get going. So if you have the flag, um, Jim Cox, would you lead us in the pledge, please? Sure. Yes, yeah, sorry, one second. <laughs> okay, I pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of, of the United, United States, States of America, America and to the republic, republic for which it stands, it stands one nation, nation under, God, under God, indivisible, indivisible, indivisible with liberty and justice, and justice, and justice for, all. for all. God save the Delta. God save the Delta. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jim. So the first uh, item today on our agenda is the public comment. Do we have any public here uh, that wants to make a comment to the board? The, um, yeah, and Madam Chair, following that, it, I, I can go through the, uh, the list of who's attending. We do have a few new ex officio members that I would particularly like to introduce. <clears throat> Thank you, okay, go ahead. Okay, yeah, it doesn't sound like there's any public comment. So, uh, the uh, Delta Protection Advisory Committee members present include uh, Vice Chair Barbara Daly. Uh, our Chair Mark Pruner is absent today. Um, uh, I believe I see Robin Brown way off in the distance behind Douglas, or maybe that's someone else, but uh, she'll be joining shortly. Craig Watanabe. Uh, I should have mentioned that uh, Vice Chair Daly and Robin Brown represent Delta Business. Welcome, uh, Robin. Uh, Craig Watanabe representing Delta Agriculture. Morris Lum representing Delta Recreation. Mariah Looney representing a Delta organization. <clears throat> Edward Hard and Stacy Sherman representing state agencies, respectively uh, state parks, boating and waterways and uh, state department of fish and wildlife. Uh, Jim Cox and Dalwit Zaleke representing Delta Habitat and conservation non-governmental entities. Russ Ryan representing Delta Water Exporters. And Douglas Shaw is an ex officio member representing Delta, uh, ex officio representative of Delta Cultural, of Delta Cultural Preservation. Thank you. That's a mouthful. Um, in addition, we have ex officio members Mario Monzo from U.S. Bureau of Reclamation. And I want to give a special welcome to Donnie Ratcliffe, who joins us from the U.S. Uh, Fish and Wildlife Service. And he'll be our new ex officio rep from the Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, in addition, we have guests uh, Gilbert Cosio, Elizabeth Patterson, and Cynthia Lau. And I think I've covered everyone ex aside from the commission staff. You'll be hearing from Virginia Gardner and Stacy Hayden shortly. So welcome everyone and uh, back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Eric, um, for introducing everyone and letting us know who's here. And we miss Mark Pruner. I am sitting in for him today and we hope he has safe and fun travels. Um, to begin with, we do have a few people from the public here, Gil, Elizabeth, Cynthia, and other, perhaps others. Do you, would you like to make any public comments? I don't have any now. Thanks, Barbara. You're welcome. OK, anyone else? So uh, Eric, shall we move on then to uh, receive and discuss the report on the Delta Conveyance Design and Construction Authority Stakeholder Engagement Committee by Captain Jim Cox? Yes, please. Okay, Jim? Okay, well, this Thank time you. I think I may use up the 10 minutes that I'm allotted. Uh, the meeting in, uh, in September was covering air pollution and dust created by the project. A lot of the committee members were not satisfied at all with this presentation. The, uh, they had vague references to a baseline level of air pollution and dust, but no real numbers. The, uh, just modeling. Procedures for monitoring dust and pollution and procedures for attempting to control the dust and pollution when the baseline is exceeded, but still, but they're still based on on all modeling. Most of the monitoring procedures will be done within the construction zones. Many of the committee members 
found this presentation to fall short because the air pollutants in the areas of the construction zone, but are not at all monitoring the, the pollutants outside of the construction zones. Now, I have no real background in air pollution, and, you know, airborne pollutants. And as I listened to the presentation, it did seem very vague to me. Once some of the more informed members of the panel started asking questions, it became very obvious that the vagueness was hiding something. And, and I feel that DWR, by not including any real-time numbers in the report, are really attempting to hide the incredible volume of dust and pollutants that this project construction and operation will produce. The, uh, the presentation described how they will try to control the dust and pollutants, but they concede that baseline levels will be exceeded. They admitted that mitigation will be needed due to the excessive dust and pollutants, but no reference to the amount of that mitigation. And the, again, because they're basically just giving you procedures and information based on modeling. And many of, of the members of the committee pointed out that the, the strong winds of the Delta are gonna spread any airborne pollutants and dust. And, it's go, and the prevailing west to east winds are gonna take this, these pollutants right into the uh, environmental uh, justice areas, primarily around Stockton. Uh, and I will say at this point, the meeting started getting pretty interesting. The, uh, Barbara uh, Perillo from Restore the Delta, who was representing the environmental justice communities, announced that she would be resigning from the SEC. Yeah, she has sent out a resignation letter and it was part of a Restore the Delta uh, emailing. If anybody wants to see that, I can forward it to you. But her resignation, at, the explanation she gave at the time was that she felt that her participation and Restore the Delta's participation on the SEC were in good faith. But after this presentation by w, DWR, she felt that DWR is not participating in good faith and she felt she could no longer be on the committee. That sentiment has been expressed by a number of people and there have been resignations from this committee. Uh, Many of us on the committee that have, that have been frustrated by the procedures that they've you know, enacted started to speak out at this time. And I think more or less to appease a lot of the complaints that they were receiving Man. out that the, uh, they decided that okay, they, they announced that the December meeting will probably be the last meeting of the, uh, you know, or maybe the last meeting of the SEC, and that that decision will be made after the first of the year. There were, there's been many times that people on this committee have brought up issues that the SEC just did not seem to want to, did not seem to want to discuss. And they kept saying, well, we'll, we'll talk, we'll bring that up later. We'll bring it up later. Well, now it's look, it's looking very much like that the later is not going to happen, that these, that these issues that we've had are not going to be discussed and are just going to be left to the wayside. And again, now they've, a lot of people were speaking out that this was not, you know, not the way that they were informed that this was going to happen. So they decided to allow the, the committee members to make suggestions as to what the subject for the, for the last meeting would be. The reason they're saying that the SEC will be disbanded is that the construction authority says that the planning phase of the tunnel system has been completed. And so there will be no more need for an SEC. So now they, so they, uh, they have asked that the committee members make suggestions what the last meeting should be about. Uh, I have brought up the fact of about Clifton Court and the pumping there and the fish kill there repeatedly. I have been told repeatedly that this is not part of this project. So I sent them an email requesting that the last, uh, last meeting subject be Clifton Court. And, I, and to kind of paraphrase what I put in there, I expressed my frustrations of being on this committee that 
sends me out to talk to fishermen, but then won't listen to what the fishermen have to say. Silly me, I thought they would want to actually hear what fishermen have to say, but they don't. And I found, and I put in the email that I find this answer, that Clifton Court is not part of this project, to be incredulous, that here you're going to spend two decades of planning and building, build the state-of-the-art system, but continue to have the absolute worst aspect of the old system continue to operate and continue to kill millions of fish. So I suggested that the subject of the last meeting be Clifton Court. Why is it necessary once you have this new system? And if it is to remain, what can be done to prevent the fish kills? I also made mention of the fact that the uh, they have asked, they, what I have noticed is over the over the you know last few months of this of this SEC, when you have a disagreement with them on something, they want to make a private conversation with you. I've had two different private conversations, and what I'll say about those conversations is, they are a great opportunity for DWR to fill you full of it. Both conversations I have had, I have found that the information I was given was wrong. And I could prove that it was wrong. And when in a private conversation, there's no record of what was discussed, no record of promises made. And I'm through talking to them on a, on a private conversation basis. If I'm going to ask you questions, I want it answered in front of the entire committee, not just to me. If you're going to make a promise on a discussion, I want it made to the whole committee, not just to me. And that is the, is the essence of what I was saying to them. And that I do not trust their private conversations. And the one conversation was about Clifton Court, and Kerry Buckman said to me that this would be discussed, that the that the SEC would be continuing into 2022, and that would be the time that this would be discussed. I'm feeling like I was lied to with that, just to get get me off her back about Clifton Court. And I put that into the email. I have not received any answer from them. This was close to a month ago that I sent them the email. I full well do not expect Clifton Court to be the subject of this last discussion, but it well should be. And so we're just, so now we just wait and see what's going to happen with this. They uh, would like to say that being on this committee has been very frustrating for me. I have been temp been uh, yeah considering resigning a number of times when they won't listen to what, what fishermen have to say. And I also put in that email that the only reason I did not resign was because I was told that this would be discussed. And I said to them, I sincerely hope that I have not, you know, spent all this time and frustration just to not, you know, not discuss the things that are important to fishermen. I'd also like, like to point out that the, uh, Excuse me, I have to check my notes again. Um, that one of the things that's very that I'm finding very frustrating with this is that over the last few sessions as we're starting to wind down, a number of the DWR people on this have made are making comments about how the SEC was such a success. And I don't see how it was a success at all. I see that. You had 20, you started off with 22 committee members making suggestions about how they could change the, their design to make it more stakeholder friendly, which is exactly what we were supposed to be doing. But out of this almost two years now of meetings, I can only see two different things, two things that were changed on this planning. They changed where they're going to put a haul road so it didn't go right through the, the Sand Hill Crane Preserve. And they decided not to run semi trucks on Highway Four, and it wasn't because they're there. This is why I don't trust their modeling at all. Is that under their traffic modeling, they said that semi trucks would not affect traffic on Highway Four at all. Now, those of us that live near Highway Four, drive on Highway Four, know that that's ridiculous. That. There's two bridges, Old River and Middle River bridges, century <laughs> old, and they were built when cars were much narrower. When you get a semi truck on either of those bridges, you're baited a one way. Now a motorcycle could probably get by, but they're using up their lane and half of the other lane 
to get a semi truck across one of those bridges. Plus, they have to wait for a gap in the traffic to be able to tie up the whole bridge going across. And they were talking about adding an average of 15 trucks an hour onto Highway 4. Now, their modeling showed this would be no problem. So it makes me wonder how much is, you know, how accurate is any of their model? And especially when it came to this air pollution, is that if this is accurate as your traffic modeling, then it's not accurate at all. And so that's one of the, the frustrating things here is that they claim we're doing such, this has been such a great, you know, great thing here. We've, we've done, you know, it's, and all I can say that it's done is that it's shown us, yes, it's transparent. It's showing us how you're doing it, but it's certainly not, you know, stakeholder friendly. They're not taking the suggestions, you know, two suggestions out of two years. I think that's that's a failure if you ask me. So if anybody has any other questions on this, I mean, I had other things I was going to say, but I'm going to, you know, get off the subject here some. And so I think, you know, if anybody has any questions about SEC, I'd be happy to answer them. And I have two things I want to say that are good news for a change. So, but I'll, you know, any questions first? No? Okay. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Jim. That great presentation. Um, I was just wondering, do you have any idea, has it ever been said uh, how far along they are in the design? What they're done. The design, they're done with the design? That's, that, was, that was the reason for disbanding the stakeholder engagement committee. That's that what they, I thought you said. That, I wrote that, that down. That was, now, unless <laughs> I got it wrong for what they said, now, I don't know, Douglas, you, you heard them. Douglas or Gil? What you got was that it's done. Well, okay, I think um, they said it's pretty much done. Anyway, when you said that uh, they are not successful, actually, in fact, they are, because the, the purpose of the SEC is to make them look good and make them avoid the mistake that WaterFix made. So the WaterFix, they did it without public consultation, and they've done it with us. So in, in that sense, they're mm -hmm. successful. Anyway, so um, uh, my take is, um, you know, uh, it's better to have a seat at the table than, and so at least we can see what's going on than not having a seat at the table. So that's my take. And then the next battle is the EIR. Yeah. But may I say, uh, making them look good is not what we're all here to do. Yeah, but then they is successful to them. They, they succeeded with us. Okay. So oh, right. Yeah, thing. okay. Now I understand what you're saying. Yeah. So that was well, from their the... point of view, yeah, it's better yeah. success. From our point of view, it's a it's a failure. So yeah. 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 So that but was two our... things have happened since our last meeting that no, are I mean we are two adversaries. But the two things that have happened since our meeting is first off, and this just happened in the last few days, Newsom has given up on his voluntary water agreements, which have been standing in the way of allowing the regulatory, you know, regulatory agency, the water boards, to actually enforce the law. So now they are going to actually be enforcing the law and not sitting on their hands waiting for Newsom's voluntary water agreements to do anything. Uh, so that, to me, that is very good news. The uh, the other good news is that Newsom signed the bill that is has reinstated the salaries, the the proper salaries for the for the science panel. And, and to me, this just shows you exactly the mindset at DWR. Their lawyers find a loophole to not to pay, you know, uh, expert scientists only $100 for an eight hour day, but yet they're willing to pay us $250 for a three hour session that is just advising. It's not, it, you know, we're all basically amateurs we may there's a few professionals in their field but we are stakeholders we are not scientists and the uh they're willing to pay us 250 dollars a session times 22 people to have this appearance of transparency but the real people that that know what they're talking about the scientists they want to cut them out and i believe that is strictly because it was the scientists that stopped this the, uh, the water fix project, and they don't want them around. They know that this project is probably not going to cut muster again. And so if you can't, 
if you can't make it better, get rid of the judges. And, and that is the, this is why I, I have seen this sort of thing go on for 30 years with DWR. They have made promises they will not, especially of the fishing community, they have made all sorts of promises that they had never had any intentions of keeping. And this just shows you that all they care about is this project. They don't care about what other damage they're going to do with this project. So I'll get off the soapbox now and let, let the meeting go on. I think Gil had something he wanted to say. Yeah, first of all, um, yeah, I agree with, with Jim saying, I really appreciate people like uh, Barbara Berrigan Priya and Jim being on the um, committee because they are the true stakeholders. I was on as a ex officio member, so I, I tried to keep my emotions out of it. I was just there to address flood control issues. It was kind of my, my job, but um, you know, we, we knew from the start, we really couldn't do anything major. They selected um, their chosen alternative without even running through the CEPA process. So we knew that was kind of a weird thing. Uh, they bifurcated just the design away from the operations, which is the true measure of the impact that's gonna happen. How are you gonna operate this thing that might impact fish or water supply or flood control? And so we were tasked with essentially helping them develop a concept that might have some improvements. So like Jim said, the, the design is done, but it's not really done done as, as far as going to construction, but it's done as far as what is the concept they're gonna take to, to final design. They're still drilling holes. So they're still getting a lot of geotechnical information on the soils, you know, down at 100 to 200 feet deep. And so that, that still has to go on. As far as um, uh, not telling the truth or whatever Jim's terminology was, you know, this is the problem you get into with CEQA because CEQA, you have to identify the impacts, but you really don't have to do anything about it. If you remember water fix, there were like 273 unmitigatable impacts. Well, who judges how mitigatable those are? Well, the proponent, and in this case, it's DWR. So we knew when they started giving us information on the EIR, the first thing they started giving us were um, some of the screening for alternatives. And pretty much every alternative they threw out there was screened out for because it didn't meet the criteria that DWR set up. It didn't, you know, we tried throwing things out there about other criteria, like, hey, you own Sherman Island, how about moving the intakes down there? And they quickly poo-pooed it for whatever reasons they developed in their screening criteria that it wouldn't work. And, you know, Garamendi's Western Delta alternative was thrown out for whatever reasons they set up. So we, we kind of knew what we were getting into, but I think the straw that broke the camel's back was when it was obvious that Barbara presented information that she has showing how bad the air quality is, and it, yet they flatly refused to extrapolate their data or add their data into the existing bad air quality. Um, again, it's one of these things that I'm sure that it would come out in the final EIR is unmitigatable, but that's, SQL requires you to identify things, but SQL doesn't require you to do the right thing. And uh, I, I don't know if we all, we all had hopes that they would do the right thing, but at least we thought that they would listen to us and then evaluate what we had to say against more appropriate criteria, whether it's scientific or geotechnical or whatever. So it was a little bit frustrating. I, you know, one of the problems we ran into, the worries we had going in is that they were going to use our names as a justification, kind of what Douglas described, that to them, they did get 22 people into a room. I don't know how many times we met, 20 times or whatever. And uh, so in their mind, it's going to come out in their EIR. Hey, we vetted it through all these people. They helped us design the location and route. Um, it probably won't say that none of these people agreed that the tunnel was needed, but that's kind of what the way we went into it. And the last thing I have to say, um, you know, Barbara's resignation, if, if you read her letter, it is fantastic. I and mean, Barbara was a key component of our group. I mean, you know, she could have come in with guns a blazing and started shooting, but she didn't. She, she followed the rules. She gave good impact input. And, um, when she had to leave because of the issues that came up at the September meeting, as Jim described, the, her resignation letter is fantastic. She explained all of her intent, how she kind of kept to her intent, yet at this point, she was she was just to the point where she could not continue, and that, that was fantastic. So if Mariah or somebody could send out that letter to all of you, it's, it's a good read if you haven't seen it. Thank you. Thank you, Gil. Um, 
M Madam Chair, uh, Sam yes. Garcia is joining by phone. He asked to be recognized, but also before you do so, I want to welcome Jeff Henderson from the Delta Stewardship Council ex officio, Sam Garcia, committee member. And I think we have, is that Chris Elias as well that joined us by phone? We have someone else joining us by phone who I, I don't quite recognize the number, but um, anyway, go ahead. Thank you. Um, thank you, Gil, so much for that. Yes, uh, Mariah has posted in the chat that she will can provide the letter if anyone is interested. Mariah, if you wouldn't mind sending that out to all of us. Some of us I know have it, but sure. just in case there are others, thank you. I, and, I just posted the link in the chat, but I can also send it via email. Thank so, you. You're would, welcome. Would you like to uh, state your chat? what you said next about clarifying the VA process? Yeah, so the voluntary agreement process, I just wanted to clarify with everyone um, because this is all new information still relatively. Um, the voluntary agreement process on the San Joaquin River side has been abandoned. However, it has not been abandoned on the Sacramento River side. So um, if you hear people to con continuously talk about voluntary agreements, um, the process, unfortunately, is not over. Um, and although the State Water Board will be going forward with implementing phase one of the Bay Delta plan, um, the, it, it's kind of a, I, I don't necessarily know that the administration abandoned the VAs on the San Joaquin side and gave the phase one of the Bay Delta plan as like a <laughs> bargaining tool, but um, the VA process on the Sacramento side is still going, and then also that means that we're going into phase two of the Bay Delta plan, um, and at least for Restore the Delta, it's going to be a lot of testimony and research and all of that stuff. So um, just wanted to clarify because it is a very confusing process, um, and we believe that it's uh, it's systemically confusing. So um, our role at Restore the Delta is to help everybody else understand the things. Um, so we will keep you all updated. I, I'm going to drop my email for the people of the public. Um, if they want to learn more, I'll drop my email in the chat as well. Thank you so much, Mariah. Uh, this is so interesting. Jim, do you have anything else to add or before I ask for any other questions? Well, one of the things that I've been you know, thinking about a lot, uh, you know, because I see the effects of the the way they pump water across the delta, I see it all, I see the effects all the time, is that even if we had a system that they were building that we all could get behind and say, oh, this is, this is going to be great. It's still 20 years off. And we are going to have another 20 years of scouring the bottom of the delta. And to me, it's like we need to not only we need to be directing what's going to happen down the road, we need to deal with things right now that right now the, 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 the food chain of the Delta has been affected from the bottom up by the scouring of the mud out of the bottom. There are places now that, you, that, were, that 20 years ago had a 20 foot base of mud on the, over a bedrock bottom that now the mud's gone and it's down to the bedrock. And all of that is from the incredible flow of water across that bottom, washing that mud out life in the delta begins in the bottom and this is killing the delta from the bottom up and we i don't know if we can take 20 more years of that before another system would would be taking over that the last 20 years have been horrible on the delta and another 20 i don't think we're going to have salmon we probably will have some striped bass we'll probably have some catfish but i think salmon is going to get wiped out in this next 20 years if something isn't done now and as that's also very frustrating when you're looking at down the road but you're knowing that this is a bumpy road to get there so you know that that's one of my big concerns uh, eric how do we reply to that uh i i don't think we do but sam did want to speak and uh, we, we do have a pretty full agenda if it might be time to move on to the next item so Okay, Sam. Yeah, I, was the environmental document completed and certified? No, it, it, the the EIR, the EIR and the EIS are both anticipated in April or May of 2022. And um, 
I just I heard somebody say that there's um, that the air quality impacts aren't reliable. And I was just curious if the um, air board or the air district commented on the document as to the accuracy of their analysis. And if you guys have information suggesting that their analysis that they did was inaccurate, you know, one way to go about it is to go to the air district because they have to review and they will review that document when it gets routed. They haven't done so already. Uh, there might be another avenue if you think there's impacts there that have not been adequately addressed or the information supporting those impacts was flawed. Just yeah. my two cents of another opportunity. If that's if there's an un, un, if the impact was not addressed appropriately, that's another avenue. Thank you, thank you, Sam. Um, and if there aren't any other comments on this, I'd like to make one comment uh, that speaks to Jim's last statement as well about we can't live another twenty years like this. If um, thinking back when we had our first meeting of this group at Mike Campbell's house, we all ran around the room or the yard and, and said why we were on this committee and what we wanted to um, add to it or get from it. And um, I remember the thing I said was that I really thought this committee could help the Delta Protection Commission come up with alternatives because what we need are alternatives right now we can't wait another 20 years. How do we help um, move this process along? We're not trying to stop Southern California from, from receiving water. It's how is it managed better? And is there anything we can do? Um, that was several months ago. It kind of got lost in the shuffle, but I still believe that. And that's how I would um, respond to your statement, Jim. Okay, sorry, okay. I have a question. I have a question. Yes. Okay. Now everybody's talking about the next defense line will be the commenting on the EIR. Yes. So how solid can you make that defense at the at the commenting on the EIR? How solid can we make that defense? Um, mm -hmm. Yes, that's, that's a good question. Um, do you have anything to say about that, Eric? Well, uh, from the commission's perspective, we're going to be reviewing that those environmental documents. And again, it's both an EIR under CEQA and an environmental impact statement or EIS under the National Environmental Protection. I, I should never try to spell oh, out the NEPA. acronym under NEPA, under NEPA. <laughs> so it'll be two documents, but they will be released contemporaneously. And we're going to review them very carefully, just as we did. BDCP and Cal Water Fix, and uh, looking at the effects on unique delta values. And so th this, this is a little unusual to kind of front load the discussion with uh, bringing, you know, detailed design and, and uh, engineering type information to a body. And, you know, we kind of welcome it on the one hand, but we curse it on the other because look, I'm under no illusions that we're going to change the proposal that DWR has. They're set on their proposal. It's gonna work its way to the bloody end. And so um, I don't know if they will lose their appetite for it because it will be so expensive to implement this project that they'll lose interest or whether something else will happen that will cause them to lose interest. But it's, very clear to me that there's never been one interest on their part in evaluating any other alternative other than their proposal to put intakes along the Sacramento River on either side of the town of Hood and somehow send that water via tunnel to, well, Clifton Court Four Bay or now Bethany Reservoir even. So maybe that's one change, but so we'll, we'll be looking at that environmental document. Presumably it will have a lot more detail than its predecessors did, but we'll be evaluating it with the same careful scrutiny that we gave the other two. At least we've had some practice. And 
We have had that. <laughs> We've had practice. The other thing I'd just like to add really quickly is um, the National Historic Preservation Act, Section 106 is now on the table and has started its um, process. And one of the, I guess you would say rules of the National Historic Preservation Act is that they are start, supposed to do this process before the project is 10% of design. And with the design being completed, it really um, it brings to question the, uh, the legality and how they're uh, moving forward with that process. I don't know. I think we're gonna talk about that later in Eric's um, announcements on the work that's happened since the last meeting. So uh, anything else on this? Okay, thank you, Jim. Um, Eric, shall we move on? Yeah, great, great presentation, great. Jim, thank you so much. The next item is the uh, receive and discuss the final draft recommendations for the Great Delta Trail Master Plan by Virginia for 25 minutes. Well, good evening, uh, everyone. And uh, hopefully my presentation will not take the entire 25 minutes. I'm going to try to make this a fairly quick presentation. Um, I know it's difficult to adjust from uh, this very significant discussion about uh, the conveyance project, but um, uh, if you can, uh, sort of take a deep breath and, and, and change gears. We're going to talk about some of the constructive efforts that we're doing um, uh, on the Great Delta Trail. And I'm going to, um, I'm going to uh, have Eric is gonna be um, running the slides for me, but I just it, wanted to- It should be on the screen. Are people seeing this? Yes. Great. I think. Yes, I can see it. Yes. We okay. Can see it. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, so tonight um, we're reviewing with you the recommendations of the master plan as we propose to submit it to the commission in a couple of weeks. Um, we'll also be summarizing the contents of the rest, you know, not just the recommendations chapter, which is chapter three, but the other chapters. And we definitely are interested in any comments and suggestions and questions. Um, depending on the extent of your comments, if we get them um, soon enough uh, in the next couple of days, we might be able to incorporate them into the revisions to the plan for the commission. But since we have to get it accessibility reviewed um, and then mailed out in a timely fashion, comments that we receive probably after about the end of the day tomorrow may be um, reviewed and analyzed and processed with the public comment period that will be in November. So um, I just wanted to, to mention that because this is not a rubber stamp plan. We, we, we would like to get any questions or input and comments um, from you. And that's the reason why we're going to run through the recommendations. Um, and so next slide, Eric. So the reminder of the plan area, it includes um, the entirety of the Delta primary and secondary zones. It does also include the Sassoon Marsh and the National Heritage Area, um, part, most of the National Heritage Area, and of course includes legacy communities um, in the incorporated and unincorporated areas. Next slide. So the plan is structured in five chapters um, with supporting information in the appendices. The appendices have sort of ballooned. We have, um, <laughs> it's gone from being appendix A through F to appendix A through I, I believe, um, but it's all good information. So, um, and we wanted to keep the plan pretty stripped down. Um, we have, of course, the introduction and overview that where the um, chapter one sets the context with a high level of the rest of the plan and summarizing public outreach results, including our public survey, um, levy manager survey, uh, and um, outreach to uh, in one-on-ones with various uh, planning agencies, 
that are implementing, actually going to implement the plan. Then chapter two covers the great complexity of the Delta, which is how we describe the um, opportunities and constraints section. Um, we go into a fair amount of detail there. Um, chapter three then is the meat of the plan and that's where a lot of the maps are. Um, and so I will not be showing you all the maps, but Eric has uh, sent to you the chapter three draft. And we, we've sent, um, it looks as though we may have not sent all of the region maps. Um, there were two more that may not have gotten sent out. So we can make those available to you uh, because the Delta is divided. Um, we have divided into four regions. And I'll talk about that some more in just a moment. Um, chapter four covers um, the design elements. Um, five is the um, implementation. And um, then of course we have the appendices. So next slide. So um, to date, we've done outreach by doing a public survey over the summer. We've had um, several technical advisory and stakeholder advisory committee meetings. Uh, we also conducted a levy manager survey um, online and on paper. And then we had focus groups with levy managers. Um, um, and um, Gil, for example, is one of the people who really contributed a lot um, in providing comments um, and suggestions as we were uh, finalizing the draft with my, um, an eye to um, addressing concerns that levy managers would have. Uh, next slide. So um, on the outreach, the public outreach survey portion asked questions like it helped us to um, inform what the trails should be, asked questions like what should it look like, a main trail with connections um, uh, to other trails, a network of connected trails across the Delta, one single continuous trail, and then a series of disconnected local trails. And as you can see, the top two were a main trail with connections to other local trails and a network of connected trails across the Delta. And so basically what we did was kind of uh, both and. <laughs> uh, it's a combination of those first two. So um, uh, next slide. So that was the public uh, survey component. Then what we got from working with our technical and stakeholder advisory committees was um, we were soliciting local context and planning suggestions, um, such as what parks plans were in um, most current and that should be included in our recommendations. Um, they gave us significant amount of data that we've incorporated into our maps. And so as you look at the maps, which I'll show in a little bit more detail than this um, in a few moments. Um, the, um, uh, we, we had additional input for th issues such as where adventure hubs would go, um, where interim trail segments uh, could be used while uh, proposed trail segments are being developed and so on and so forth. Next slide. So then the third leg of our um, outreach stool um, was the levy managers reclamation districts input. And basically we got some good reality checks, um, fatal flaws and opportunities. Um, we also had some good input regarding trail design elements that we've included in chapter four. And we got a lot of good historical context and nuance, especially in the one-on-one -on -one and focus groups sections where people really drilled down about their particular experience. And we were able to, to, to get a better sense of where some um, issues, they're very sort of regional. So some issues were more related to trash and um, you know, off-roading by ATVs as opposed to people who were going through fences and going fishing or along the way, uh, stealing copper wire out of um, uh, irrigation pumps and so forth. Um, next slide, please. So drilling down a little bit into the actual um, 
uh, chapter content, uh, we include the background legislation, legislation and trail vision, where there are existing trail segments which have um, been adopted and designated by resolution by the commission as part of the Great California Delta Trail. Um, and then we included the summaries of the stakeholder and technical advisory committees and the public and levy manager surveys. Um, the um, surveys uh, are also in full included in appendices at the back of the uh, report. So we summarize the data, but if you want to look more closely at it, it's available in the appendices. And next slide, please. So then chapter two, opportunities and constraints, um, we focus, focus down um, quite a bit more on the actual, this is where a lot of the maps are, um, levy systems as the one you can see here on the slide, uh, roadways, bridges, ferries, regional trails, um, and other things such as recreational facilities. So this is where we try to identify all the things that should be considered when local planners are developing um, uh, trail segments throughout the Delta. Yeah, next slide, please. So here we get to our um, chapter three recommendations and the um, regions that we devised. We have Northern, Western, Central, and Southern. And uh, well, part of the process of doing the stakeholder uh, advisory, technical advisory meetings was we were able to refine the boundaries for those so that they, they make more sense now. Um, they include um, recommendations for the land, water trail launch sites, and land trail, water trail launch, launch sites, and adventure hubs. And I'll talk a little bit more about each of those. And then we also, um, uh, showed in on these maps uh, where the proposed Great Delta Trail segments that are um, both existing and planned um, exist. Next slide, please. So we have trail types, which include a main trail corridor local access trails that are shown by those sort of loopy dotted lines. We have water launch sites, which are indicated as um, triangles. Uh, and then we have the adventure hubs. And those um, are going to be fleshed out more detail um, as the part of the uh, National Heritage Area process, um, uh, management goes forward. But we decided to develop concepts so that we could use um, both the public outreach and uh, the Heritage Forum and other location, uh, other venues to develop and refine the ideas, concepts behind adventure hubs. Next slide, please. So really together, the uh, public stakeholder and tech advisory input shaped all of those trail types. And as you can see here, this is the Western region uh, map. And this is one of the maps that um, Eric um, sent with the materials. I believe we may have missed the South and the Central, um, but we sent the Western and the uh, Northern maps. And as you can see, we have existing trails located and shown on these maps. They're fairly busy, but we've worked pretty hard to make them um, uh, readable and usable um, in larger format than this slide. Uh, the next slide. So you can see where we, uh, for example, we recommend a potential adventure hub um, in the city of, uh, near the city of Oakley or um, uh, over at the Carquinas Scenic Loop um, uh, Carquina Street Scenic Loop Trail, where there would be a lot of potential historical interpretation there. Next slide, please. And this is the uh, northern uh, region map, which shows, you know, Sacramento, Yolo Candies, and some of the significant areas there. A lot of these map, these locations here would be legacy ba uh, community-based sites when they're available. Um, uh, you know, when the planning has taken place for those. Next slide. And then um, 
the uh, central shows some of the uh, water trail areas and some additional adventure hubs. Um, and we address issues such as the Antioch Bridge where there are some issues with even proposing that to be a pedestrian or bike, um, a bike uh, uh, pathway because it really seems pretty, pretty nerve wracking to go <laughs> across um, in other of those uh, fashions. But um, we at least put out some suggestions for potential ways to um, get around that. Uh, but really it will be up to the local governments to do to address some of the planning issues of those na of that nature. Um, I wanted to mention that the um, the 2019 Delta Leadership Group uh, developed many of the water trail launch sites that are shown on these maps. And so we really appreciate that the work the work that they did um, that really fed into this. Next slide is the um, uh, the southern and last region, which encompasses the Stockton area. And as you can see, they're a little bit more problematic in terms of trails being able to get um, uh, across the Delta, but there are some very good water trail launch sites um, as well. So next slide. Um, the chapter four trail design elements really try to take into account all of those um, constraint issues or, that might be considered, including all of the infrastructure such as rail lines, bridge, cro bridge crossings, um, uh, rail uh, road crossings, et cetera. And um, if you have any suggestions, we're, we're really asking for comments on the recommendations, but if you have the opportunity as the public process goes forward to give us input on the trail design elements and of course the rest of the plan, that would be greatly appreciated. So, uh, next slide, please. So chapter five is the implementation chapter. And really it's sort of a constant cycle of developing, starting with local planning, um, and uh, design, construction, and operations considerations. But outside of that process that's at the local level, uh, the local government comes to the commission and proposes designation as a, a, a Delta Trail. And we have a set of uh, criteria that would qualify mostly that our considerations that we would like to see taken into account if a, if a debt trail is going to be designated as part of the great California Delta Trail. Um, and, and part of that is our um, um, uh, checklist that's in an appendix at the back of the report. And uh, next slide. So then, um, Key master plan dates. Um, excuse me, that's my timer telling me to stop. Um, key master plan dates is tonight's presentation is important to us and hopefully I've allowed you enough time to provide questions and comments. Um, on the 18th, we plan to present the plan to the commission and with their blessing, um, we will go to public review from the 18th of November to December 16th. Um, and that'll include outreach that will be one-on-one um, -on -one meetings with different community groups, as well as two virtual presentations, um, one on November 30th and one on December 8th, both will be in the evening at this time. Uh, and then at the conclusion of the public review period, we'll include, uh, we'll complete revisions to the plan and submit um, the plan in January uh, to the commission for hopefully for adoption. So um, we've covered a lot here and um, I hope that you have not fallen asleep. <laughs> Um, and if you have any questions or um, want to offer some suggestions or comments right now, we did present to you in September. Um, you can move to the next slide, please, Eric. Um, uh, but I'm sure that with additional information about more specifics, you may have more questions and more comments. So last slide, thank you. Um, and I can um, reopen 
any of the slides if anyone has any questions uh, or um, suggestions. Very welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Virginia. Great presentation. Thank you so much. I can't see anything except you and the slides. Eric, does anyone have their hands up that would like yeah, to? Yeah, Douglas and Robin, uh, Douglas Shaw and Robin <laughs> Brown. Thank you. Hi, I would love to, um, thank you. I would love to see the first slide that was up of all the trails in the Bay Area, Bay, Bay Delta. You, the very first slide I had not ever seen before and I was so thrilled to see it. It's, it's amazing, oh. isn't it? Oh, um, backwards, uh, Eric, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm not sure. Oh, okay. Robin, this one, this, yeah. this one here. One. Yeah, not the screen screen. Screen. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll take a screen. I'll take a screenshot. Oh, good. There's my screenshot. Yes, and and the plan will be available as soon as it <clears throat> uh, goes to the commission as well. Um, but yeah, it's amazing uh, the resources um that we can link to are fabulous, um, yeah. and so that's why we're really excited about the plan. May I ask the um, trail that, that is called the McCullamy Coast to Crest Trail. I'm familiar with the trail, very familiar with it back in my college days from Oakland to about Antioch, as I recall. And uh, that trail is there, is that correct? And then it continues on, it shows to Walnut Grove. Is that just along the highway or? Yeah, some, uh, it's worth noting that some of these are just, um, hoped for trails, they, they probably just follow roadways. And so yeah. it's not that these exist as, um, you know, uh, wide shoulders or grade separated in a way yeah. that uh, would, you know, you would expect to have with a lot of traffic. So uh, it's, it's a worthy uh, side note to include that some of these are more conceptual in nature, some are actually trails. Sure. McCullamy okay. Coast to Crest, I think once it hits the bay, the, uh, the, the bay trail, it's actual trail, but as it winds its way through the delta, it probably is just following a route on roadways. So yeah, with McCullamy Coast to Tre Crest, um, years and years ago, the hope was to follow the East Bay Municipal Utility District pipeline easement. And of course, the, for the section that's above ground, that's a, a public safety issue. And so that sort of came off the table. And I think that they are now looking um, for opportunities wherever they may present themselves. So I'm that's sorry. definitely conceptual. Yeah, Virginia, I'm sorry, what did you say is off the table? The East Bay Mud uh, Municipal Utility District um, pipeline easement because of, you know, post 9-11, everybody with a water pipeline wanted it to be, either underground or protected in some way. So they're, they're concerned about security. Uh, okay, okay. Well, gosh, would that, would that be a great coast to, to crest, the Pacific Crest Trail? Is that ultimately where it um, ends up? I see it goes through, does that say Lodi? Yeah, Lodi. Yes. I mean, the vision. And does yes. it eventually go to the Pacific Crest Trail? It, it goes to Lake Comanche that specific and then it continues on up it's part of the, because the McCullamy at that section is scenic wild and scenic river so um, if you're interested I can put you in touch with a woman that we've reached out to who's um, uh, in charge of, of um, I think she's an executive director of the of the organization thank you I would love that okay and madam chair we have hands raised Russ Ryan and Stacy Sherman Yes. Hi. Thanks, Eric. Hey, two questions. Um, one is, can we have, is there, chance, is this posted, this presentation? And if not, can we get a copy of it? Um, it's not posted yet. And we actually are planning as part of our outreach, we're proposing to put up a presentation recording of uh -huh. the, um, uh, on, as a link on the recreation web page, the commission's recreation web page. This specific presentation, um, I can uh, provide to you, but we're at this point, we're trying to um, preserve the commission's ability to be the decider about um, the, the, the public draft that's submitted. So it may not be instant. Oh, and I understand that. And I understand 
reasoning behind it too. Um, my other question has to do with, you made a comment about going east to west in the south region, southern region. You ran across some, some issues with that. Um, I know that there's Highway 12, which is a major crossing. And I know that there's probably some issues dealing because you have to take those bridges and do something different. And that's going to be an additional cost. I'm assuming that's part of it. Um, yes, uh, right. Right. Uh, also, the Antioch Bridge is just a challenge. We, we at one point were considering suggesting that a ferry be investigated, but we've we've generally moved our recommendation to being that that the commission is going to support any um, the local government's consideration of any opportunities for crossing the river, um, yeah. and and um, and other other crossings, not just that one, but the other ones that are currently can present issues. Because there's certainly enough uh, right of way, Caltrans right of way that's adjacent to the alignments along 12. You know, there's plenty of room, so to speak, other than the choke points at the bridges. Yes, 12 and um, 4 is a little bit sketchier. <laughs> 4 is um, even worse. That's, that's just the reason yeah. where they were talking about in the beginning of this meeting. 4 has is, is got its own um, a bunch of problems. Uh, that it need to be addressed before you start attaching people in trails. Yes, yes, adding, compounding the issue. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Virginia. That was a good presentation. Yeah, thank you, Russ. And a reminder for anyone on the phone, if you'd like to raise your hand, you can do so by pressing star nine, star nine. Okay, Madam Chair, you've got Stacy Sherman and then Mariah Looney. Hey, thanks very much for this presentation. I really appreciate it. Um, so sorry, I'm new to the group and you know, this may have been discussed at earlier meetings, but I was wondering if there had been any coordination with BCDC in the Sassoon area. I'm sorry, with, I couldn't hear you. Uh, BCDC, the Bay Conservation and oh, Development oh, yeah. Commission? Um, yes, we, we as uh, part of a couple of different strands, but uh, yes, we have definitely reached out um, with them and gotten input from, um, not formally from BCDC so far, uh, but we do hope to get, if they have any formal um, presentations, but some of the uh, planners who are working on things such as the water trail um, in areas for the entire Bay, plus the Sassoon Marsh um, have been providing us uh, really good information that we've incorporated. Okay, great. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm involved with uh, monitoring wetland restoration in the Delta and Sassoon Marsh. And so um, there have been a lot of discussions with BCDC about how to incorporate any potential public access uh, for some of the restoration sites. Uh, so for Wings Landing in the marsh, um, there is a, like a, a water trail that's part of that. Um, and then I also wanted to let y'all know that a couple of wetland restoration projects are, are just now breaching or have recently breached that I believe have some uh, public access uh, attributes, so Hill Slough. Yes, Dutch Slough specifically. Dutch That's Slough. a great yeah. new one. Um, the re there's a city regional park that um, is going to be developed there. And um, we've spoken with the city planner for uh, City of Oakley. That's actually one of the reasons why we are hoping to include them as one of the adventure hubs, because um, there will be a new water launch site that, they're the, that we're hoping they'll propose um, to be part of that. Um, yeah. So they, they gave us a lot of good information. So did East Bay Regional Parks. All right, great. Well, thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. And anyone else, Eric? Mariah, what, I think you were wanting to ask a question. Uh, not necessarily a question, just um, I was a part of the Delta Leadership Program class of 2019. So this was, um, it's so cool to see this come um, so far. Right, because we, uh, the way that our class uh, kind of, we separated by where people lived um, in the Delta. So um, it's so cool to see this really full circle. So thank you so much, Virginia, for this presentation. I'm very, very excited. And um, if Restore the Delta can help in any way in the, the, especially in the South Delta area, like, please let us know because we are, um, 
really committed to helping with public access um, in the in areas that are not necessarily uh, given public access um, or people don't necessarily know about the access that they do have. So, um, so, so excited about this and I can't wait to hear more as the project goes on. So oh, great. Yes, actually, um, I, I, I'm just a little bit behind, but I'm going to be sending an email out to your class, the 2019 leadership program, um, to let everybody know um, that that we are using the project that you folks did and encourage just exactly as you suggested that everybody who was in the class, if they can, you know, engage people to provide comments and review the draft master plan, um, it would be really fantastic. So thanks. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Looking forward to it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mariah. Um, Eric, I have my hand up. <laughs> Please. Thank you. Um, two things. One is if you have a flyer for these meetings in uh, November and December that you could send to all of us that we could post in the Delta and let people know that you're having these. I, I don't know how you were planning on doing it, but a flyer. Would I was be I was going to be out there posting them myself and get and having Eric help me. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. Good. <laughs> and we can we maybe we can meet up and have coffee. <laughs> yeah, and we can do both both ways. <laughs> Yeah, we, we are proposing to put the, um, we didn't want to do it too early in case people start to take them down. So we'll be posting flyers as well as doing more of the online type outreach. Um, the starting the weekend of um, Veterans, Veterans Day. So after that Veterans Day holiday. Okay, that makes sense. And yeah. my other, just a comment, it's, uh, I don't know how out, far out it might be, but at the Antioch Bridge problem to cross, it might be a good place to have an adventure hub and have a concession to cross there. Uh, you know, somebody that wants that as their concession job kind of thing. So um, just a thought for that. Hey, why not? <laughs> Thanks, Barbara. <laughs> kind of far out, but yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> Anybody else, Eric? I don't see any other hands, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Virginia. That was great. We all enjoyed that presentation. Um, our next item is to receive update on the Delta Flood Preparedness uh, by Stacy Hayden. Great, thank you so much for having me. So for those of you who I haven't met and who don't know me, my name is Stacy Hayden and I'm the Information Officer for the Delta Protection Commission. And I just wanted to give you a little bit of background today on the work that we've done with, with the Commission for Delta Flood Preparedness efforts throughout the years and our most recent project, which I'll share with you in just a moment. So each year we have been hosting the Delta Flood Preparedness Week. It just wrapped up this year. It was October 23rd through 30th. In the past, this week was typically the week right before California Flood Preparedness Week, but for the past two years, we've been running the weeks concurrently. There was really uh, a desire to increase coordination efforts between our agency, uh, Department of Water Resources, as well as many local agencies who also do flood preparedness efforts throughout the state. And throughout the years, we've had a number of great projects that we have developed specifically to help the Delta community understand flooding in the Delta, learn how to prepare should there be a flood and all of the many resources available to them before, during and after a flood emergency. So some of the products that we have created have included radio ads, We've held the Delta Flood safety event for several years. We've done direct media outreach. Uh, we've also done Spanish language translation of materials the past couple of years. And we've done direct outreach to families over the past several years through the River Delta Unified School District offering up resources uh, through their Wednesday packets through all of the schools. 
Um, you may know as well and may have received it. We've been doing the yearly calendar, the Delta Flood Preparedness Calendar, each year that gets mailed out to about 5,300 residents in the primary zone of the Delta. Unfortunately, this year we were not able to acquire the funding that we needed to print the 2022 calendar. So we will not be uh, sending out a 2022 calendar for this next year. But we do have a new and exciting project that we did develop and that is the Delta Flood Ready website. The goal of this website was not only to help our promotions during flood week to try and reach more people in the Delta to share valuable information, but also to meet the goal of doing more flood preparedness education throughout the year and really have a central hub that can be utilized in all kinds of different education outreach materials and marketing that might be done to educate the Delta public on flood readiness. I'm gonna share that website with you in just a moment. Let me share my screen. Okay, so you're welcome to look follow along here with me, or if you'd like to pull up the website, it is deltafloodready.com. We do have a new logo. And so there's a lot of great resources here that are specifically geared towards the needs of Delta residents. Um, for instance, we talk specifically about the resources available in the five major Delta counties, which of course are Yolo, San Joaquin, Contra Costa, Solano, and Sacramento County. This site is a brand new site. So as you're looking at this, and I'm gonna ask you to, to take a look at this at some point um, in the near future here, just keep in mind, uh, we, it was built very quickly uh, just due to some, some funding time constraints that we had to, to get the website uh, hosting up. So we're definitely still going through this and, and making sure everything is exactly how it needs to be. Um, but there's a lot of room for growth here as well. So right now we only have the one event Delta Flood Preparedness Week, but actually each year, particularly in non-pandemic years, there are actually a number of flood preparedness weeks within the Delta or flood preparedness events of different kinds throughout the Delta region that we'll be able to share here as a resource. And I'm not gonna go through the whole website, but just to give you a highlight, we do have a Delta as Place link just to give people an idea who maybe aren't as familiar as of, um, you know, the Delta as, as a place and, and what that feels like. There's a map there. We have some general facts about floods. We have a great library that we're starting to build with flood videos that are currently on YouTube. We talk about the resources available that people can go and just enter in their address to figure out if they're in a flood zone. Most people in the Delta, of course, are, um, but it's great for people to be able to have that visualization and really connect to the idea um, that they are in a flood zone. And we talk about the different kind of flood alerts that are out there. Under Flood Ready 101 is really where we begin to start sharing educational resources, really starting with Family Ready. Something that was important about this website is making sure that the whole website is really written in what we call like you verbiage. It's very directed towards the individual and it's written in very clear, very simple, easy to understand plain language. And so when you come onto these educational pages, there's lots of links that bring you to all of the other resources throughout the website, as well as other outside resources and resources that we've developed in the past as well, such as our flood safety handouts. I highly recommend everybody um, who lives in the Delta go get these PDFs, print them out for their family and keep them available at homes. So please definitely take a look at those. And we do have those developed in both English and Spanish language. Hopefully other, over time, we might even be able to do more work in other languages as well. The other important thing about this website, um, besides it's just being very accessible to someone that's gonna come to it, we also have translation um, language for the whole site available as well, uh, is, excuse me, lost my place for a second. <laughs> is the idea that preparing for 
a flood can seem incredibly overwhelming. Um, you come to a site like this, or you go to other sites built by, built by other government agencies, and there's this list upon list of all of these different things that you have to think about. And we're really trying to think about underserved populations when we're developing this. So people that may not necessarily have a lot of money to build out an entire emergency kit, or you know, they're raising their family and maybe they're working multiple jobs. It, the amount of time it can take to um, create an evacuation plan and think about everything that they need to do to get their property ready, for instance, which we talk about on the website, um, it can really be a lot. So the language utilized in this website is trying to, to ease that feeling of overwhelm to get people to understand that um, they can do a lot of these steps, you know, one thing at a time. They don't have to do it all. They don't have to do it all at once. Everything. Um, even preparing a little bit is better than being not prepared at all. And when it comes to doing things like building out an emergency kit, which we talk about, we really talk about that, you know, it's possible to do this over time as well. It's possible to purchase these things, you know, some of these things, for instance, at discount stores and garage sales. So really trying to make it just accessible for everyone. So everyone in the Delta can be prepared. So as I mentioned, there's also these county resources. Um, it's a little sparse at the moment. We're mainly focused on people knowing their access to their Office of Emergency Services, and each county has an alert system as well. So driving people to sign up for their alert systems is something that is found throughout these other pages on the site, like Property Ready and Family Ready, as well as under the Resources tab, things like creating evacuation plans for families. So we do talk a lot about you know, preparing yourself and your family throughout this website but we often mention for businesses as well to think about their staff and their customers and maybe having, for instance, evacuation plans for them. We know that there's a lot of Delta residents and business owners, particularly the primary zone of the Delta that have land, that have livestock and making sure that we're talking about and addressing their potential needs as well. So there's other things available here, like some information about flood insurance, weather and river conditions, and some background on the reclamation districts as well. So this is, as I mentioned, a brand new site. So what I'm hoping is you'll be able to take just a few minutes to go through and see some of the initial resources that we have on these pages. And we would love your feedback. Nobody knows your area better than you. And there may be specific needs for your community, your county, um, that we can address on this website. There may be um, you know, other opportunities for reaching especially underserved persons and communities in the Delta um, that you may be aware of as well. So please just take a few minutes when you get a chance and go through the site. And if you have any ideas or any other resources that you can think of, um, we would love to just keep growing this website over time. So some of our next steps with this website is to continue to develop out more social media throughout the year to share the resources available here. Um, and then the next thing that we plan on doing is to get vinyl signs, made big vinyl signs that can be hung up, um, particularly in the legacy communities. These signs will not have dates on them. They will say Delta Flood Preparedness Week, but they won't have the dates. Ideally, they would go up in the legacy communities during flood week and drive people to the website and then also hopefully to our social media through the website as well so people can get more information every year. So with that said, we're definitely looking at you know, Clarksburg and Hood and Walnut Grove, um, Rio Vista, etc. Cortland to get these vinyl signs up for the next flood week. So if you know of any good locations or the people that I might need to talk to in order to actually get these signs up during flood week, that would be really useful information as well. And I'll make sure to put my email in the chat. And of course you can um, also go to delta.ca.gov to find my email there as well if you're on the phone. And it looks like Okay, I don't see any questions in chat. 
So if you do have any questions or any thoughts at the moment, I would love to hear them. Please feel free to raise your hand again. If you are on the phone, you can do star nine. Otherwise you can raise your hand in Zoom. I see. Douglas raising his hand and Russ. Oh, sorry, let me do this in order. I see Russ raised his hand first. Please, Russ. Yeah. Hey, hey Stacy. I just <clears throat> I just accessed it while you were giving your presentation online. It looks great. Looks it looks really good. I a lot of a lot of information, a lot of resources. And this fits in very well with the mission of the reclamation districts and protecting levees. Uh, fits in very well. Um, I, I will take a look and uh, maybe uh, shoot you some comments just because there's some visual things too. Um, you know, just FYI, for people who are colorblind, you might want to take in consideration of your blues, just in yellows. Sometimes that it's hard for those folks to read that. Thank you. Uh, our colors were run through color contrast analyzer for accessibility but not necessarily color blindness. So I yeah. will check into that. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you, Russ. Also, um, I do want to mention as you're going through this website and maybe you have some other ideas for different kinds of outreach for flood preparedness, we're always happy to hear those as well. So we're definitely open to options with this website, just kind of being a hub for future projects. <laughs> Okay, I have Mariah. Thank you, Stacy. This is great. This is a really, really good resource, and I'm so excited to, um, you know, look more through it. Um, I would only say that, you know, I great job thinking about underserved communities. Um, in particular, I, I'm thinking a lot of South Stockton. Um, they are historically left out of conversations, but especially around flood control. Um, they are not necessarily on the river or on levees that they um, know a lot about. So um, I would love to have some more conversations with you about that and how to access those communities. It wouldn't necessarily be, you know, with Restore the Delta, but with some of our community partners um, and just see, uh, you know, a lot of South Stockton has no idea what the flood risk is for them and it's quite high actually. Um, the Delta Stewardship Council did a really great um, assessment uh, recently and we have tried to um, get that out as much as possible but I still think that there are communities who could really benefit from this information that um, to, through no fault of the commission just have been unable to be accessed for a long time. So. Um, that's my only comment, but this looks great, and I'm so excited to um, be able to share this, and and I look forward to more updates and everything. This is really great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mariah, and yes, we, we would love to build up more of a partnership program around flood preparedness, education, and outreach, um, so I would love to talk to you more about that. Yeah, and I do just want to give a shout out to Chris Elias and, and uh Sajafka because they um, they also want to do that work. We've had some conversations about that as well. So um, really looking forward to, to more. So thank you so much. Great, thank you. Well, let's keep that conversation going. Okay, I have Douglas. Hi, I'm Robin Brown. Hi, Robin. Hi, I'm on DPAC, but I'm at Douglas's um, house. Mm -hmm. um, Stacey, may I ask, are there ways for, or how would people get a map of their area of elevations? For instance, I have a map, happen to have one of, of Grand Island where I live, and it's so interesting to find your property on what elevation it is, therefore really how high your risk is. Right, you know, let's, let me take a look real quick. I know that if you go to, am I in a flood zone? and go to the flood risk map viewer. I'm just going to that now. I'm going to check mine. I'm not sure if this has elevation or specifically or not, but it does provide very detailed maps. So if you give me just one moment, I can answer that question. Thank you. Okay. 
Okay, so. Okay, well, it seems like the flood viewer map wants to take its time here. So let me look into this a little bit more. I know this map really does do a good job of showing um, a property in a flood area and what the risk is. I'm just not sure if it specifically states its elevation or not. I believe it does, but I'll get back to you in chat, okay? I'll, I'll share that with everybody if I can Thank you. figure that out once the site comes up. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. You're muted, Barbara. Thank you. Great presentation, great questions. I don't know how good my question is, but it's just kind of occurs to me with all that's going on in California in general. Would a lot of the information on your website also apply to fires? Our information on our website is very flood specific. We do make mention in the flood facts that uh, areas who have experienced a fire may be more pl uh, prone to flooding. That's not something that's really been developed out um, for the site. Uh, there's definitely, you know, different considerations between flood and fire, although of course a lot of overlap as well. But so, but I would not say um, fire is addressed very much on the site. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Stacy. Eric, anything else that we should cover here before we let Stacy go? No, I just I really appreciate the uh, the comments from advisory committee members. I, I think this can be a really uh, powerful tool. It, it's, it's possible that this information is all out there, but I don't know that it's all compiled in one location that is so easily digestible. So I, I really appreciate what Stacy has done with this. And we, we do want your suggestions on ways to improve it, or if there are, are materials that should be included that aren't, we'd really like to hear that as well. So, um, and we'll, uh, we'll get our vinyl banners up and make sure people understand where to go to find this information. And if you have ways of spreading the word, all of you, please, uh, please do so. Thank you. Yeah, and just one, one more note is, you know, I spent a lot of time on various disaster websites and particularly government websites and, and so many of them are just, you know, very cluttered from being kind of just built and added to and added to over time and, and can seem very overwhelming. So definitely the goal with this website is to really get as much useful information on there, um, but to make sure that the information is pertinent, um, directly helpful um, without causing um, that sense of, of overwhelm, you know, things that people can actually start working on relatively easily is, is definitely a goal here. And having correct numbers to call, I think is. Yes, <laughs> yes, because <laughs> they do change. I, I've had to check they it every do. year. Nothing <laughs> published, it changes. Uh, uh, Sam. Sorry, I uh, had a hard time coming off mute. Uh, I it actually got a question for Barbara. Did you ask for fire maps? For fire zone tiers? Uh, I asked for is a lot of the same information for the flood. If you have a, a disaster of a flood, would a lot of the same information apply if you had a disaster of a fire? Um, so, okay. you know, would it be a lot of the same numbers to call? Would it be a lot of the same emergency kit? That type yeah. of thing. Gotcha. Yeah. I would say, you know, things specifically like emergency kits, um, as well as the different county resources would be useful for any type of disaster. Right. Yeah. We just don't necessarily address that, which might, might be helpful. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you, Stacy. We all appreciate it very much. Um, and I guess the last item on our agenda is Eric. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair and Commission members. I'll, I'll just give you an update on a few 
<clears throat> commission activities, and uh, we'll see if we can get you um, get you off to your evening here a little sooner than our usual. Uh, first off, our commission will meet on November 18th, just in a few weeks. Uh, the focus of that meeting will be on the Great Delta Trail Master Plan. Um, we'll be setting our commission meeting dates for 2022, and there's a few other potential agenda items that we're um, contemplating at this point, but it will be a pretty light agenda on November 18th. Um, moving on, related to the Delta Conveyance Project, and, and uh, Barbara alluded to this earlier, but we, we have convened meeting with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. They're leading what's called a Section 106 process, which is ensuring that the project, in this case, the Delta Tunnel Project, is um, addressing the, the requirements of the National Historic Preservation Act. And uh, we have most of the Delta counties participating. We have private groups participating. Uh, the commission is uh, trying to coordinate uh, so that it can facilitate the participation of all these different groups. But the, the intention is to ensure that um, historic resources, and we're taking a, a broad view of historic resources, that they are appropriately considered and, um, um, <coughs> excuse me, and um, mitigated for, if you will, uh, as, as again, as required by the National Historic Preservation Act. We had, our <clears throat> we had our initial kickoff meeting with the Corps of Engineers just uh, last week, I believe, if not the week before, and there will be more to come. If there are other entities that are interested, and we're especially interested in including the historical societies, um, you know, they, the, the historical societies can speak with authority that um, we, we don't necessarily have, we don't understand the resources as well as they do. Uh, for anyone contemplating participating, we will make it as easy on you as possible by supporting you in every way possible, but we would encourage some additional participation in those Section 106 discussions. And uh, Virginia is the lead for us on the commission staff. You can contact her or contact me. We'll, we'll get you in touch and get you included. Um, there was a um, transportation meeting in Sacramento County, uh, Southern Sacramento County. I don't know if anyone from DPAC attended that. I believe it was a week ago, Monday. Um, October 25th, I believe, was the date. Uh, this is now the second of these meetings. It, it, is, is, is anyone on the meeting participating in those discussions? Um, I can't really report on them. I think there are important discussions involving public safety officials. Uh, the CHP was prominently featured in this most recent uh, meeting and the focus is on uh, the traffic challenges, the unsafe driving conditions in that part of the Delta. Um, I guess I'll move right by it if no one else has participated, but uh, Barbara wanted me to particularly mention that. I'm, I'm very interested to get updated on those discussions and uh, um, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll attempt to uh, get a better description of that by the time DPAC meets next. Uh, moving on, related to our national heritage area in the Delta, tomorrow uh, will be the Delta Heritage Forum. It's an online event. It will convene at 2 p.m. in the afternoon. It will extend into the early evening. You're welcome to attend any part of that. Uh, we do ask that you register. It helps us to, uh, to know who is attending and we'll ensure that we can do good follow-up with you. You can find all that information on the commission website. It's prominently featured. It was part of this week's uh, Delta Happenings email blast, which if you are not receiving our emails, you should ask to be included on that list. You can 
sign up for that on the commission website. But again, Delta Heritage Forum will be tomorrow. This is now the third forum that we have conducted. This year's forum will have more of an emphasis on the uh, Sacramento San Joaquin Delta National Heritage Area, but will also include other presentations uh, by people from throughout the Delta region. So please tune into that if you would. Um, I think I mentioned to the advisory committee when you last met in September that the commission uh, participated in conjunction with the city of Isleton, uh, Valley Vision, and other parties to submit a broadband funding request to the NTIA, I'm an acronym uh, challenge tonight. Virginia Gardner was our lead on this, but a federal funding source to support broadband development. We do expect to hear the result of that application within the next two weeks. And so at our commission meeting, I'm guessing that we will be announcing the results of that. I hope that it's a happy announcement and not a sad one. But regardless, we will continue to work on this broadband issue. Um, this initial grant application enabled us to uh, really get well mobilized for other potential funding. And there will undoubtedly be other potential funding, both state and federal, to enhance uh, broadband in underserved areas. And so if any of you have a particular interest in that, this initial application primarily covered the, um, the area between Isleton up to uh, Cortland, actually up to Clarksburg, so the river communities. If there are other underserved areas of the Delta, and we're certainly not uh, averse to working within the urban Delta as well, um, we'd be you know, happy to, uh, to be working on that with you. So let us know if there's something that you're involved with or you think we should be involved with We'd like to be talking with you about that. Uh, moving on to the Delta Leadership Program, Mariah mentioned that earlier. We have a few um, Delta Leadership alumni amongst the group here, including our vice chair. We are convening a new cohort of the Delta Leadership Program. We have a uh, applications are being accepted through November 19th. And we will convene uh, the fifth cohort of the Delta Leadership Program with a, an initial seminar on uh, January 7th, the first Friday in January. Um, and that will continue over the course of the next four months and conclude in April. Uh, it's really a great opportunity to connect with people throughout the Delta region to get um, a better grounding and some of the important policy issues that we confront throughout the Delta and to have a little emphasis on personal skill development as well, all with a goal of making our participants uh, better able to serve their community or their uh, organization that they represent or uh, the, the work that they do in the Delta region and, uh, and really to build connections across the region. It's really gratifying to me to see the Cortland area farmer make a connection with uh, the urban activist from Stockton when these two people probably would not have met but for this program. So, um, and Mariah has her hand raised. She probably has a little testimony to offer. But. I do. I am the biggest fan of the Delta Leadership Program. <laughs> um, I, sorry, I live right next to the fire station, um, but I highly, highly recommend um, if you have not done it or if you know someone who is um, active in, in the Delta, but they don't necessarily know um, all of the Delta, this is a really great opportunity. Um, I still talk to a lot of my classmates. I've been involved in alumni efforts as well with Eric and, and Mike Campbell. 
And it's just, it's such a good opportunity to truly understand the Delta in all different aspects. And I mean, I've now worked for Restore the Delta for almost four years. This is what I do, but I learned so much during the leadership program um, that has really helped me within the my role at Restore the Delta and just um, in my career in general. So um, I highly recommend it. I will be I will be the uh, poster child for it as long as I can, Eric, as long as I have the opportunity to. Um, and, you know, I'm really looking forward to some of the people that I've spoken with that will be applying. So um, highly recommend it. Please send it to the people that you think would be interested because it's a great opportunity. Yeah, thank you, Mariah. I really appreciate that endorsement. And uh, I would ask DPAC members to consider um, nominating people. Um, we might have some self nominations. Those are perfectly appropriate as well. But uh, we do uh, want to convene. We hope to convene a group of about 20 people in this uh, fifth cohort. And so November 19th, plenty of time, doesn't take a whole lot of time to get the application completed. And uh, please spread the word and bring us some good applicants. So thank you for that. Um, just a few more things. Uh, I think uh, uh, Barbara mentioned earlier, or someone referenced earlier, the governor signing the Delta Independent Science Board legislation. This establishes a salary for Delta Independent Science Board members that is very commensurate with their skills and abilities and talents. And uh, clarifies the independence of the Delta Independent Science Board as a body. Um, a small bill, but had a big effect and is something that we, the commission strongly supported. Our, our commission voted to endorse that bill. We were very uh, glad to see it pass out of the legislature and be signed by the governor. And already those uh, contracts are making their way to independent science board members. So we're getting them uh, the, comp the compensation that will ensure that they can take an active role. And they've been a very helpful entity to, um, you know, ensure that we're um, taking the right tack on uh, proposed projects within the Delta. In addition, and on a slightly less uh, optimistic or favorable note, uh, there also was legislation passed, a provision in a larger bill that exempts from CEQA habitat restoration projects. I guess some of you might be uh, big fans of this. Um, we have a concern over the exemption from CEQA in terms of how um, proposed habitat restoration projects in the Delta that might affect other Delta values, whether it's agriculture or recreation or historic communities how those uh, considerations might be addressed if there is a exemption from CEQA for that, those projects. Um, this is something I'm working on with our chair. I don't know if anything can really be done to um, smooth down the, the rough edges of that uh, proposed provision. It is, it does have a sunset date a couple of years out, and so it won't necessarily be here forever. But um, it was one of those provisions that uh, followed the adoption of the budget and went through in a hurry at the end of the session and probably could have benefited from a more you know, thorough review through the normal policy process, et cetera. So more to come on that. But uh, I, since I was mentioning legislation, I wanted to mention that as well. And I think Eddie's going to remind me of the $12 million for removal of abandoned and derelict vessels. <laughs> well, I could. Um, that's not what I was going to say. I was just curious, what was the legislation that that uh, it provides for the CEQA exemption? What was that called? Well, it was included in, in uh, what's called the Resources Budget Trailer Bill. Okay. And if you want to look it up, it's, it was Senate Bill 155. Okay. 
Uh, it's now been chaptered, so it, it has a chapter number, but you can look it up by Senate Bill 155, and it's provision 20, 21 or 23. Okay. It's a lengthy bill, so that'll help you find it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and then finally, I wanted to announce something to you that I have talked with the commission about, and I have talked with the commission staff about, but I have not mentioned to anyone else, but if you tune into the November 18th meeting, it will be public at that time. And that is that I'm going to be leaving the commission. I guess the term is retirement, although I don't quite know uh, if uh, that is a, the apt term, but I'll be separating from the commission, not for a while, I'll be around until probably next summer. And I told our commission members that I, I'm committed to being here until we can have a, an orderly transition to a new commission executive director. And I think that should allow us plenty of time to do a good recruitment, to find the commission good candidates to consider, and then to bring that person on board, hopefully with at least a little bit of overlap. So it'll be somewhat seamless between me wrapping up my work and the new person uh, starting their work. So. Uh, target date probably early summer of 2022, which seems like a lifetime away, but I know we'll be here before we know it. So uh, because I've worked so closely with all of you, I wanted you to be one of the first group outside the immediate, immediate family to hear about my plans. And um, I've had a great, awesome run at the commission. I'm not done yet. I still have... Uh, some uh, important work to do and certainly need to set up this good orderly transition to whoever will follow me. Mm -hmm. But um, one of the things I'm most proud of is uh, reconstituting the advisory committee. It had fallen into a little bit of uh, hiatus uh, before I joined the commission. And I think it's just been one of the, the best things that has been helpful to the commission is to have the input that you all have provided. It's a great sounding board for myself and for the commission staff. And you know that we've <clears throat> utilized you regular, regularly for that purpose. Um, but I'm, I'm really proud of uh, the, the group that's developed. And uh, some of you have been at this for almost as long as I've been in this role as executive director. And uh, I thank you for your longevity and everyone else who's joined along the way, but um, I'll miss working with you, but I wouldn't say I'm necessarily done in the Delta. I don't intend to take another full-time job. I'm not even sure I'll be taking another job, but I, there's a few things that I would like to continue working on, and I'll be happy to do so as a Delta volunteer, just like all of you. So, um, We'll have a few more meetings, uh, no, no farewells just yet, but I did want you to be able to hear it directly from me and be one of the first to hear it. So, and I see a lot of chats coming up on my screen and I appreciate the well wishes. Thank you. Wow. Yeah, um, we're certainly gonna miss you, Eric. Um, real, I mentioned in the chat, you're the heart of the DPAC and you keep us organized and meeting and moving forward and uh, your leadership and your calm hand on the way you keep us moving when we get sidetracked is very much appreciated and i don't know how we replace that but uh, you've been uh, just a fantastic leader for all of us oh that's kind sam i have no doubt that i will be replaced very ably and competently and heading in new great directions and so um i i'm i'm real excited to see uh you know who succeeds me and what direction they they take the work of the commission okay you can type i can just talk you can type well, you, can talk. you have something to say robin oh yes eric gosh wow well you've been wonderful um may i ask when did you start with the commission uh, I started in August of 2013, so I've now uh, had a, a full eight plus year tenure. It'll be almost nine years by the time I, I think I'll be ultimately leaving. 
Oh my goodness. Yeah. So that's oh, a, you know, I'm, I'm probably approaching, if not past my sell by date. So <laughs> I don't think so. Well, okay. No goodbyes yet. Yeah. Thank you for all your amazing work. And some of you I'm going to meet in person rather than just via a zoom screen. I, Robin, you certainly fit that bill. We've talked on the phone. We've seen each other on the screen, but, uh, Yes, I've seen you at some meetings, but I'm just one okay. of the audience. So yeah, <laughs> I've I've met I've seen you. Yeah. Great. Wow, Eric, yeah. I didn't realize how much I care about you until just now. <laughs> 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 that just hit my heart. So uh, I'm gonna miss well, you. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you, thank you all. I'm gonna take a look at the chats before we leave the meeting here, but I I appreciate the good words, and I'm I'm serious. There's plenty of work still to do. I, I ain't checking out yet. And so, um, and, and speaking of more work to do, uh, according to our schedule, the next DPAC meeting would be on January 4th. Uh, that's the first Tuesday of January. Um, you know, DPAC is a, a body, uh, just as the commission is, that's governed by um, what's called the bagley Keene Act, which you all know the Brown Act as uh, relating to local government. Bagley Keene is the equivalent of that, uh, that is the open meeting law for state agencies. And um, the legislature, I forgot to mention this in talking about other bills passed, but the legislature did pass a bill and the governor signed it that allows um, local agencies to continue meeting via Zoom like we're doing here through I think until through 2024, it only allows uh, state agencies to meet um, on these remote means through January of 2022. I do expect that that will probably be extended, whether it's by legislation or by governor executive order. Um, and, you know, heaven forbid we're back in, you know, bad situation with the pandemic uh, over the holidays, but, um, you know, we, we met that one time in Mike Campbell's patio. That was really great to see a lot of you. Some, some of you have joined DPAC even subsequent to that. Um, I think my recommendation would be to continue to use this zoom channel for the meeting in early January. It's authorized, uh, beyond that, we'll see whether, the legislation is extended either uh, through action of the legislature or by order of the governor. But um, I did want to ask you that, uh, just as we're wrapping up here, if you all are okay with this kind of a Zoom meeting again, when we meet in January, uh, um, we still haven't quite perfected our approach to uh, what, what I call a hybrid meeting where you have both people in the room and then people joining remotely. We're looking for good models of that. If any of you have seen them that don't require a lot of expensive equipment, <laughs> we'd love to know it and don't require maybe uh, the uh, uh, T1 um, high-speed internet line because some of these meetings we do in areas where there, there are some internet challenges. But anyway, I'm covering a lot of ground here, but I guess what I'm ultimately saying is um, I suggest that the January meeting via Zoom, and um, and then we'll see where it goes from there. But uh, if anyone has any particular preferences on that, um, I'm sure um, uh, Chair Chair um, Daly would love to hear those. And I'll I'll give a recap of this to uh, to Mark Pruner as well. Yes, um, I vote for January being on Zoom. So um, anyone else I see in the chat, um, Mariah says yes to Zoom in January. And so does James. Yeah, I'm not seeing Fox. any objections, so. Objection. Um, yes here from Russ. Mm -hmm. And I would love for you to, to put a hybrid together if you can, because I have to leave town for a while again. And if I could participate by Zoom, that would allow me to continue with the group during that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. 
Well, first things first, let's, uh, if you can mark your calendars for Tuesday, January 4th. Uh, unless 5 p.m. is a problematic time for anyone, why don't we call it at 5 p.m.? I'll send out a, a meeting invitation soon so that it populates on your calendar. And then more details will come as we get closer to that date. Okay, thank you, Eric. Thank you so much. Thank you for everyone who attended and participated and for all of your presentations. And um, I think we can call the meeting to close at 6.57 p.m. Thanks, Barbara. Thank you, Barbara. Thank, thank you, Barbara. Thank you. Thank you.